You know, speaking of friends, I have a friend. Um, he's a pastor, and uh, he, he's a pastor here in Miami. He, um, he doesn't really uh, have a church um, that he leads. He's a part of uh, a church, and he helps here and there. And uh, he makes uh, a living by driving Ubers. And in this time of the year, he, um, he plays Santa Claus, okay? He has a, he's a super tall guy with a big beard, and he's a natural Santa. And, uh, and so he gets uh, a lot of jobs during this time of the year. It helps to bring, bring income into his family. And uh, this past week, he was here in Key Biscayne at the Ritz-Carlton doing just that. I don't know if any of you guys took your kids to the Ritz-Carlton to see Santa. If you did, he was Santa. And uh, yesterday, as I was uh, driving uh, from my house to uh, a Christmas party up in Boca Raton, he texted me and he said, hey man, I, I've been placed in the spotlight. And I was like, well, what is that? He sent me a link to a US Today article and a New York Times article. Uh, he made it big. You know, they, there was this video that was made of him that went on viral. Because uh, w as he was there, there was this family that came with a little girl. And uh, he invited the little girl to take the picture, sit on Santa's lap. And she said no. And he looked at her and he says, good for you, little girl, for standing up for yourself. Your body is yours, it's your, it, your, 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 you control your body, and you can say no to whoever you want to. And so the mom recorded that and put that on TikTok, and that thing exploded, right? So if you, if you, even if you look right now, I mean, you'll see it's been millions and millions of hits because of uh, this word that he gave to this little girl. You know, a simple word of encouragement and truth to build courage in others put the spotlight on him. And you know one of the amazing things about Christmas, we're going through the season of, of Christmas and we're reflecting and meditating about Christmas. Christmas uh, reminds us that even though sometimes in life we're going through the motions and we feel ins insignificant at times, that what God wants to do is envelop us with his glory. He wants to shine the spotlight on us so that we can not only see our true worth, but that through our lives, like Pastor Lance, the lives of others could be blessed as well. I, I want to I turn to you to the passage that we have uh, in front of us today, which is in Luke chapter 2. Uh, this passage is the passage that tells us uh, about the moment that God first broke the news to the world that his son had been born. I don't know if you remember when that happened in your life. I remember when that happened in my life and my first child was born. Um, I called everyone. I took pictures. I emailed and texted everyone pictures. I put it on Facebook. I tried to make public that very special life-altering, changing moment in my life. And, and this is what this passage is about. God making known to the world the day that his son or the moment that his son was born. So Luke chapter 2, we're going to read verse 8 through 22. I, I ask you to, to bear with me and to read along with me. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to be on the screen behind me. This is what the Word of God says. And in the same region, the meaning this is Bethlehem, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known, saying that 
had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary, Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. You know, there's three things that this uh, passage uh, teaches us. Uh, This passage, number one, teaches us uh, about the setting of Christmas. Where did it happen? Where did it take place? Secondly, this passage teaches us about the people of Christmas. Who were the people that first experienced uh, the birth of Christ and the announcement of his coming and his birth? And then, and then thirdly, this, this uh, text tells us about the light of Christmas. What, what kind of light uh, came into the world through Christmas? And how can that light also envelop our lives? I said from the beginning, I'll say it again, God's desire is that his light, especially during this season, would enter into your life. Uh, but first, the setting of Christmas, where it happened to take place. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, the text tells us, and I, I made sure... Uh, that uh, y- you knew that it happened in Bethlehem. You know, it's uh, verse one, it says, and in the same region, why does it say in the same region? Because the passage before tells us about Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. They were there because there was a census and that's where their family was from and they had to be registered in that city. And so when they went there, which by the way was the city of David, whom both of them, Mary and Joseph, were descendants of, it's while they're there that uh, Mary's water breaks (laughs) and Jesus is born. And and he's born in a manger because there was no room for an inn. You guys know the story. And it's while they're in that little, uh, you know, barn in in the middle of... uh, a field in Bethlehem, that as, as that happens, as that happens, simultaneously, the text tells us that there's these shepherds in the field who hear the news. Now, I, w- I, want, I want you to understand the significance of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. This is one of the 350 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled about the coming of Christ. You know, the coming of Christ was prophesied thousands of years before And through thousands of years, new prophecies would come. And when Jesus comes into the world, those prophecies are all completely fulfilled. From the moment of uh, his birth to the moment of his death to his resurrection, they're all fulfilled. They're all the fulfillment of these prophecies of old. So it's important that you understand that Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem because the prophets had prophesied that as we... Uh, we're reminded in the book of the prophet Micah in chapter 5, right? So uh, this is in accordance to God's plan. This is in accordance to God's will. But there's something even more significant about Jesus being born in Bethlehem and this announcement of his birth being done to these shepherds. The text tells us that not only was Jesus born in Bethlehem, but uh, he was born at night and that the announcement was done by night. When God announced to the world that his son was born, he announced it at night to a group of shepherds, which to me is uh, really emblematic of the condition of the world that God in the flesh entered. Uh, He entered into a dark world. We live in a dark world. And no matter how much science evolves and no matter how much human enlightenment comes into play and makes life easier and better, which by the way, it has been. I wouldn't want the world to go back even 20 years. I think that uh, things in many ways are getting better, but even with all the human enlightenment that has entered the world, it will not be able ever to lift the endarkment that lies in humanity. These wars that we see breaking out, in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe and sometimes in, you know, in neighborhoods in Chicago uh, are a reminder to us that this world is still a dark place. Uh, the crisis and the conflicts that we face relationship-wise in our marriages with co-workers are a reminder that we live in a dark world uh, as we are being subject to pains and suffering in this world, 
it is a reminder that we do not live in a perfect world, that we live in a world that lies in darkness. It was in darkness when God first entered the world, and it continues to be in darkness. That's just the reality of the world in which we live in. And the reason why no amount of human enlightenment will be able to lift the darkness that lies over this world that we live in is because the source of darkness in the world is the human heart, is the human heart. Uh, the reformer, Martin Luther, German reformer, used to talk about the human heart as the condition encorvato se in Latin, which means it's curved in on itself. The human heart is curved in on itself, which agrees with uh, what Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was an advisor to many Russian presidents, used to talk about when he said that the, light, the line that divides between good and evil comes down to every single human heart. Uh, sometimes we tend to think that evil is what happens outside of us. Uh, it's, it, it's what comes out of certain groups of people, certain classes of people, certain political parties. Uh, we think that uh, evil is birth in a lack of education, and it's not at all the case. What the Bible teaches and what Solzhenitsyn reminds us is that the line that divides good and evil comes down to every single human heart. Our hearts are as dark as the world that we live in. And the reason why the world is dark is because the human heart is still dark. And Jesus comes into the world in that reality. And if you don't believe that, here's what the Word of God says in Jeremiah about the human heart. This is from the message version. The heart, your heart, okay, is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. And I love how, I love how this translation uh, puts forth this truth because one of the effects of darkness is disorientation. When you are in a pitch dark place, you don't know where to go. You don't know if you walk uh, two or three feet, you're going to bump into something, you're going to get hurt. You don't know because darkness is disorienting. I, was, uh, remem I, was, I, re I remembered uh, in the past week as I was studying this sermon, uh, the story of uh, this British explorer that tried to explore Antarctica and his ship was stranded in a glacier, uh, Shackle Shackleton, right? Uh, and he said that as they were stranded there, and they were stranded there for many days, I think it was like 40 days or something ridiculous in Antarctica, right? He says that the worst thing was not that they were stranded. It was not the cold. Think about that. It was not the lack of food. It was that they couldn't see two inches before their eyes. The darkness is, is disorienting. It unravels you. And this is precisely the condition of the human heart. This is what God does when he comes into the world. He comes into a world in darkness for hearts that live in darkness. But he comes to a group of people as well. Who are the people that God comes into the world for and to? And I, and I think that this, there's a significance here on what we read here in this text and it's, it's not by chance that the first people to hear about the birth of Jesus are shepherds. They're shepherds. Uh, because uh, what God chooses to do is he chooses to um, reveal his light to people that are off the spotlight. Okay, that, that rhyme, that kind of, I could throw that into a rap song line, I mean, a he, 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 but it's true, like he, he chooses to reveal his light to people that are off the spotlight. And these were the shepherds back then. Uh, shepherds, you know, we look at shepherds and we're like, oh, these are amazing human beings that live with these fluffy animals. And, uh, you know, today we have a different perception of shepherds that they had back then. Back then, shepherds were considered the lowest of people in that society, in that community. L let, me, let me just uh, share with you what one biblical commentator says. He says, shepherding had changed from a family business as in David's time, King David's time, which was a thousand years before, uh, to a despised occupation. The rabbis considered them to be religious outcasts and their testimony was not even admittable in court. And this is what Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, used to say about shepherds. He says, the laziest are shepherds <laughs> who lead an idle life and get their, substance with, get their subsistence without trouble from tame animals. So, so, so they were not really well seen back in those days. And yet, 
Jesus shows up into the world, and God announces the birth of Christ, not to kings. He doesn't, he doesn't send an angel into Herod's palace. He, he doesn't go into the temple in Jerusalem and announces first at the uh, high priest and says, uh, Mr. High Priest, I just want to break the news to you before it goes public tomorrow so that you can rubber stamp it. He doesn't do that. He doesn't go to the high priest. He doesn't go to Herod. He doesn't go to Rome and says, Caesar, oh, Caesar, let me tell you about what I'm about to do. I'm going to tell you when that day is going to happen so that you can be prepared. He doesn't do that. He doesn't announce it in the high places. He announces out in the fields in the middle of the night to the people who did not live in the spotlight. They were off the spotlight, the shepherds. And I think that this is a very important realization that we must all have because there are moments in life, and maybe you're going through a season or a moment in your life right now where you feel unappreciated, where you feel unnoticed, where you're not recognized. You feel like a ghost. You go into work and nobody notices you. You go in and out. Nobody says a word. There's no compliments about anything that you do. Uh, maybe, maybe that's you. You come in home and you're unnoticed by your spouse. You felt unnoticed. You felt unappreciated for a season right now. Maybe by your children. I mean, you've done all these things for them. You've sacrificed for them and you're, you're unappreciated. You, it goes unnoticed. And there's, there's times and seasons where we go through moments like these. And, you know, people cannot live life without any sense of acknowledgement and recognition. That's something that we crave from the very early days from our parents to say, hey, uh, you're doing a good job. That matters. We, we live for that type of affirmation. But what happens when we don't have that? I think that nowadays it's actually on the other extreme that people are addicted to that type of affirmation and recognition and that makes us entitled people. Uh, and so we want more than we actually <laughs> should be getting anyways. Uh, and I'll tell you this, I, I was looking at a research talking about Gen Z's uh, this past week, and they said that uh, 57% of Gen Z's, okay, I'm going after Gen, Gen, Gen Z's right now, they would rather be an influencer than an astronaut. So go, go look it up. They would rather be an influencer than an astronaut. Because we have become addicted to acknowledgement and recognition. And the, tr the truth of the matter is that most of us won't get it, but the message of Christmas comes to encourage us to say, even in those moments when we feel unappreciated, unrecognized, unnoticed, that the Savior of the world saw you and he came for you as he saw the shepherds out in the field that no one would see even during the day because they worked at night. The Savior of the world saw them and valued them and acknowledged them and put them in the front of the list when he was saying, these are the people who I'm going to make known my son's birth. And there's a word that obviously comes to the shepherds as they're out in the field. I mean, it's, it's an amazing sight to them. As the angel speaks in verse 3, he says, actually verse 10, he says, and uh, he said to the, to the shepherds, fear not for behold. These are the words, fear not for behold. I bring you great news that will be for all the people. It's, it comes first to them, but the angel says to the shepherds, it's not just for you. You were at the top of the list. We broke the news to you, but it's for all the people. And that means two things here. Uh, Jesus, number one, came into the world for all people. There is no one, there's no one that is beyond the need of a Savior. Even those of you that think that you don't need anything because you have everything or that you have everything together, your life is all little perfect life, religious, everything well put in place and together, 
There's no one that is beyond the need of a savior. And that reminds me of that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, who was this uh, leader in his uh, community. He was a member of the synagogue, and he was one of the leaders of the synagogue. He was a wealthy man, and he thought that he was morally all right. He thought that he was financially and socially all right, and yet he has this conversation with Jesus in the middle of the night, too, by the way, and Jesus says to him, you too must be born again. And if people like Nicodemus need to be born again, if the Savior came to people like Nicodemus, he came for you too, regardless of who you are. No one is beyond the need of a Savior. And maybe no one has had the courage to say this to you. I'm going to tell this to you. You're not good enough. You need a Savior. That's why he came. But, but not only that, no one is out of the reach of the Savior as well. No one's outside of the reach uh, of the Savior. Meaning, uh, sometimes in life we look at certain people and we say, man, there's no hope for this person. There's no hope for that neighbor. There's no hope for that friend. There's, there's no hope uh, uh, for that coworker. There, there's no hope for that person. We look and there's no hope for my children. There's no hope for my spouse. We look and we say, there's no hope for people. I, w- I was having a conversation uh, this past week with some friends who were telling me about this other friend of theirs that he is very accomplished professionally, very smart. He's always pushing back on their faith and et cetera. It's, he says it's so hard to have a conversation with him because he thinks he knows everything and he doesn't need anything. And I, I don't think that there's any hope for this guy. And I said, no one is outside the reach of a savior. When God wants to do his work in people's life, he comes through like what we see here in this story. He goes into the darkness of their life, into the darkness of their hearts, and he shines his light through Jesus. So it's a moment of hope for us, for the people that we have given up on. Christmas reminds us that no one's outside of the reach of the Savior. And so you may find yourself right now in a season of, of darkness where you're lost, where you're disoriented, where you are hopeless, where you are discouraged. But I want to tell you something here. There's a good thing about being in that place because it's in the darkness that God does his thing. And the darkness, the night, is the place where we dream. We don't dream during the day. We dream at night. It's, it's when we dream that there is opportunities that arise, that hope is reignited. One of the important things about going to sleep is because our dreams are rekindled and we can re-envision the future. And then we go into life and we live for dreams, right? In fact, when we go through certain accomplishments, we say, the dream has come true or I'm living the dream. But where the dreams happen and take place first, they happen at night. And it's at night that God wants to work in your heart. There's this uh, poem written by this uh, medieval priest by the name of John of the Cross. It's, uh, it's it's, It's entitled The Dark Night of the Soul. And he says that oftentimes we go through moments of darkness in our own soul, not because of sin. We just, we just, go through moments like that because of the world in which we live in and the the broken condition of our hearts, uh, there's moments of of darkness. And he says that when when, when moments of darkness like that happen inside of us, God sometimes, sometimes allows that darkness to sit in so that we can sense our need for him. And unless we went through moments like these, we would not sense the need for God, but God allows us to go through moments like these so that we can sense the need for him because Like I said, it's in the darkness that God did and does his thing. How does the Bible start in Genesis chapter 1? In the beginning, God created all things. And in verse 2, and the earth was dark and shapeless, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. It was when everything was shapeless and dark that the Spirit of God was at work in creation, and he's at work in the dark, also in redemption as well. God works best in the dark. And when we come and we bring our darkness before him, instead of disgusting God with what we present to him, we are welcomed and embraced and it allows for his light to come in and shine in us and through us. And so what is the light of Christmas about? How can the light of Christmas 
affect us and impact us as it did those shepherds that day, what we read in verse 9, the glory of the Lord shone around them. How can the light of Christmas shine around us as well? There's three things very quickly that I want to go through. The first one is you must listen. The angel shows up and the angel is talking to the shepherds. Many of us have missed God's visitation in our lives because we're not listening to him. I don't know if you knew this, and I've used this illustration before, but there are thousands of airwaves moving through in us and in this room right now. And the reason why we don't understand what these airwaves are bringing us in terms of news is because we don't have the apparatus, a radio, to decipher what those radio waves are bringing. But it, they're here. They're coming, moving through us in this room. If you have a radio, uh, the apparatus, you can tune in and you will decipher the message. and It will be clear to you. And oftentimes, that's how God works. He's always speaking, but we're just not in tune because we're busy with something else. And we're focused on something else. And we're not sensitive to that which he is communicating to us. So if you are going to experience this light break into your life, number one, you have to be willing to listen. Are you listening? Are you sensitive to that which the Lord is saying to you even today? The second thing that we read here is not, not only must you listen, but you must see. So the, the shepherds, they hear the message and they say, hey, this is amazing. We must now see the child, right? So they, they said, we got to go see the child. So they go in into the town and they find Jesus swaddled in this blanket in this manger. Mary and Joseph are there. But, 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 but they had to follow through with that what God was saying. It's not just enough for you to hear God speak. You must follow through to that which God is saying to you. And they understood that in the words that they had heard, that the ultimate hope of that world was pointing to that child. That that child was the fulfillment of all the longings and the hopes of the people of Israel that one day Jesus would come. And so are you willing to go to him? This is an invitation for you and I, not just to hear and to uh, God speak, but to see Jesus really manifest himself in our lives. I talked a little bit about this last week, but he's inviting us to see Jesus. Do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus in, on Christmas coming for you, taking on flesh for your sake, entering the darkness of the world to pierce the darkness in your life? and in your heart to rescue you, to redeem you. Do you see him? And you I mean, we sometimes we see him in the, in the pageants, and we, we see him in the nativity scenes. We, we see him in, in the, in the uh, Christmas cards that we receive, but we don't really see him coming for us, moving towards us, that Christmas actually was for you and I. Do you see him? You need to see him. It's when you see him that the light of God's glory begins to envelop and surround you. And here's the last thing, they sing. Verse 20, what does verse 20 say? It was the last verse that we read. Verse 20 says this, and the shepherds return after they visit Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, and the shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. You know what's cool about this story? Is that the shepherds end the passage as the angels begin. How does it start? with the angels proclaiming and singing to the shepherds. How does the passage end? With the shepherds proclaiming and singing to the townspeople that Jesus had been born. That became contagious. That announcement was contagious. When you are able to listen to God and when you're able to see Jesus in your life for you, you can't contain the joy you can't contain the realization of the depth of grace that's been manifested to you through Jesus. And you just begin to sing. And, 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 and this singing here is also a proclamation to other people as well. You're not just singing to God in the context of worship. You're proclaiming to people that Jesus has come into the world for them, regardless of how insignificant how unappreciated and unnoticed they feel he has come into the world to put a spotlight precisely on them. So here's one of the signs that the light of Christmas has really enveloped you, that you will 
sing for joy and proclaim the coming of Jesus to all of those around you. You know a great opportunity for you to do that? This week. Uh, the statistics say that if you invite people that don't normally go to church to either go to an Easter service or a Christmas service, 51% of them will say yes. So the fear of rejection is already dealt with right there. All right? This is something that you could do. Announce the coming of Christ to others and invite them to listen to God so that they may be able to see Jesus so that they too can start where you ended as the shepherds ended where the angels began. Let's pray.